Matthew chapter 6 this evening. You know, one of the things that I very, very seldom speak on, in fact, usually I speak on it when it is in the text that we're going through or the Spirit of God impresses upon my heart to speak about it. It's in the text that I want to look at tonight. The Lord led me to Matthew 6, and that is money. Money. You know, Jesus was unafraid to speak about money. In fact, he spoke about it very often. If you really think about it, look look in the uh, the Gospels. He spoke boldly and very plainly about money. Uh, perhaps it's not something that you've thought much about from a biblical viewpoint, but I'd like to do that tonight. So you have a seat. Let's uh, uh, look here in verse 19 of uh, Matthew chapter 6, and I'll read. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Here's the key. Look at verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. And then, uh, that is referring to not being greedy. Okay, and then, but if thine eye be evil, that is greedy or covetous, is what he's talking about there. When your eye is uh, the is evil, your whole body is full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse twenty four: No man or no person can serve two masters impossible for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other and here's the 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 real key here you cannot serve god and money that's what mammon is it's money you cannot serve god and money so jesus teaching here about money and the things that money can buy crucially important because of what verse 21 says. Money is the thing that reveals your true heart condition. So we want to think about that. Let's pause a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, really ask that you lead us. We want you, Holy Spirit, to just use the scripture that Jesus spoke. This is from his lips. This is out of his heart to our heart. So use the scripture that Jesus spoke to just accomplish in our hearts precisely what you desire. Lord, challenge us, convict us, change us. Do whatever you choose to do by this uh, scripture that we're looking at tonight. And thank you for it. And I pray that the end result would be that, Lord Jesus, we'd really honor you because we ask it for your sake. Amen. So, verse 21, where your treasure is, we can put the word money in there, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let me begin by saying this, that your heart, my heart, our hearts are revealed by how we view money. By how we view money. Our view of money is greatly significant because in that 24th verse, he says, you're either a slave to the Lord or you're a slave to money. You can't be both, one, of, one or the other. So I guess we should begin by asking ourselves this question, whose slave am I? Whose slave am I? Am I a slave of the Lord or am I a slave of money? Your view of money is very revealing. That uh, 19th and 20th verse tells us that the place 
that you and I invest our money really reveals the love of our heart. You lay up treasures on earth, he says, then you are uh, you are seeking to enrich yourself in the here and now. However, if you lay up treasure in heaven, you're using your money to bring people to the Lord, to bring people to heaven, to bring eternal blessing into people's lives. And really, every one of us has to make a choice as whose slave we are. Why do we do what we do? Why do we make money? Why do we spend money the way that we choose to spend it? Every one of us has to make a choice here. Money is something to be spent either for time or for eternity. When you think about your spending or your investing, which do you mostly choose? To spend and invest for time, the here and now, or for eternity? That's the choice that every one of us must make. So the heart is revealed by how you and I view money. Second thing is, the heart is revealed by what you do with money. As that 24th verse says, everyone is a slave. And we're either a slave of the Lord or we are a slave here, he says, of money, one or the other. And an evidence, what, how, how can you tell whether you're in slavery to money? What is the evidence of slavery to money? Well, I think, one thing is an over-focus on it. Be overly focused on it is one indication. I think on a very practical level, to always want overtime at work could very, uh, very easily uh, be a slavery to money. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't refuse overtime. I'm saying, but to always be wanting and looking for it. To be stingy in giving to God could be a sign of slavery to money. Hoarding money uh, could be an evidence of being a slave to money. Impulsive spending uh, could also uh, indicate, be an evidence of slavery to money. That is, spending without any direction from God or having thoughts that are consumed by money or worry over it. In fact, look at verse 25. He says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, nor yet for your body, what you'll put on. Isn't your life more than food and the body more than clothing? And so just being worried and overly concerned about things that money can buy can be an evidence of slavery to money. Covetousness, that is just wanting more, not being content what you already have can indicate a slavery to money. Remember, the writer of Hebrews says that we shouldn't uh, live covetously. We should be content with what we have as far as financial that we are. remember Paul warns in first Timothy chapter six, he said, the root of all evil is the love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And he said to some that have greedy wanted it have fallen into destructive, destructive patterns. So our heart is revealed what we do with our money. Here's evidence that you're not a slave to money. That really, you know what it is? In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 5, Paul's taking up a collection for the, the poor saints in Jerusalem that are in desperate need. And he goes to some of the Gentile churches in Asia Minor, and he comes to 
uh, the Corinthians who promised an offering and hadn't, uh, hadn't laid it out yet. And so he brings up the example of the churches in the area of, uh, of northern Greece and Macedonia. And you know what he says about them? He said they gave out of their poverty. They didn't really have it, but they gave it anyway. And he said the first thing they did was give their own selves to the Lord. And that is really the evidence of not being a slave to money. That Jesus owns you. And because he owns you, he owns everything that you possess. And you realize then that what you give is something that you want to make eternal investment. You're, you want to be generous in giving to the Lord. Always look for ways to give that glorifies the Lord and blesses the Lord using our money and the things that money can buy to glorify God and to bless God and to bless God's people and God's work. Listen, this is practical advice, and I think it's biblical too. Don't waste your money by giving to secular uh, organizations and secular causes. Now, I'm not telling you you should never do that, but I'm just, I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Let the dead bury the dead. That's the principle. Let the world pay for the things that they're focused on. We should be focused on the work of the Lord. That's where our monies ought to be invested because that will have eternal value to them. I mean, I don't have anything against giving to the uh, Heart Foundation or the Cancer Society or whatever it might be. You know, my, my son-in-law has cancer, but I'm not going to make donations to the Cancer Foundation just because my relative has it. I want my money to work for eternity. I'm going to give it to the Lord and to the Lord's work. And so I let the dead bury the dead, and I don't waste my money by giving to secular organizations. They can find plenty of lost people uh, that can finance that kind of stuff. Now, also, here's another way in which you prove that you're not a slave to money and that Jesus really owns you and all that you have that you've first given yourself to the Lord. And that is, seek God's will in purchases that you make. Pray about them and honestly evaluate the necessity of those things. You know, spend a lot of hours when you add it up in your lifetime in bed. And, uh, you know, I think a, a nice, comfortable mattress is probably something that is, you know, helpful in the long run. My wife and I, you know, she, she's complaining about the bed. It's bellowing, out, bellowing and uh, just, uh, you know, in the middle, just sinking. Maybe it's time for a new mattress. You know, we prayed about it, you know, and we're going to we're going to try a new foundation first. And if that doesn't you know, if that doesn't mean it, maybe we'll consider a new mattress. But it's a lot better just with a new foundation first. So what am I saying? You know. Even if you have the money, pray about it. Maybe you don't really need what you think you need. Or maybe the Lord can provide it another way. And you often rob, I think we rob ourselves of the blessing of seeing God provide for us because we just go out and put it on a credit card or whatever, you know, whatever we think we need. You'll enjoy peace and rest in financial difficulties, if you'll just trust God and just learn to be content with what you have. Here's a, another thing that I think is very helpful and practical, and that is your heart is revealed by what you trust in. Beginning at verse 25 down to the end of the chapter, he's, he's, he's talking about the needs that you have that the things that money can buy to meet your needs. But how do you handle that? Your heart is revealed by what you trust. And remember verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, your heart is revealed by what you trust in. I came across an interesting uh, thought in Psalm 32. 
And I want just to read this to you. Psalm 32, verse 10. Him, Get that. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Now, he's contrasting people without God, they're called the wicked, and people with God, and they are called people that trust him. Now, if you would ask me, or if I would ask you, what's the opposite of wickedness? You might say righteousness. But in this psalm, the opposite of wickedness is trust, is depending on God, is depending upon God, let's put it in our context, depending upon God instead of money. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 18, we are told in that 10th verse that the name of the Lord, which stands for who he is, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Then the next verse, the rich man's wealth is his strong city as a high wall in his own conceit. We are warned about trusting in riches, trusting in money. Paul says it in, again in 1 Timothy 6, 17. Don't trust in uncertain riches. You know, they, they can sprout wings and they can fly away in a moment. And so we're warned. So the question is, are you trusting God to provide all of your needs? Are you trusting God to supply the needs of your loved ones? Are you trusting God to supply the needs that you will have in the future? Are we trusting God to supply our finances? To do so, Psalm 32.10 says, is to be surrounded by God's unfailing love. We have to trust God in all areas of life. And if we don't, the opposite of trust is wickedness. You know what wickedness is? The opposite of trust? Anxiety. Having anxiety about our needs. That's wickedness, according to the psalmist and God. Then one final area I want to share with you. On that basis, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your heart is revealed by what you seek. You know what it says there in verse 31 to 33. Therefore, take no thought. Don't worry. Don't get anxiety filled. Take no thought. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? How are we going to be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles, that is the nations that don't have the scripture, the nations without God, that's what they seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Your heart is revealed by what you seek. For the provisions of life's necessities, are you seeking God? Or are you seeking something else, monies or finances or whatever. If you don't believe that God's the creator and the sustainer, you will have great difficulty depending upon him to supply all your needs. But if he is the creator and sustainer, you don't have any worries. In fact, if you don't believe that God's the creator and the sustainer of your life, you'll never trust God to obey when trusting him involves taking risks. You'll never really trust God, I might say, until you take risks that he leads you to do. When, you, when God leads you to take a risk and you do so and you see him come through for you, when you're vulnerable that's biblical faith. That if God doesn't come through, you're done. <laughs> if God doesn't, at the very least, you're, you're deeply embarrassed and hurt. I read a story, a true story, about a missionary to India. 
<clears throat> and he had a Hindu um, merchant storekeeper, store owner, that uh, listened to his message and came to the missionary and said, you know, I believe it. And I, I want to follow the Lord now in believer's baptism. And so the missionary said, well, uh, that pool in front of your store, uh, I'll baptize you there. And the Hindu store owner said, oh, no, you can't do that. You know, everyone in the, in the village, everyone in the town is going to see and uh, they're going to know and uh, I might lose my business. And the missionary said, well, then you're not ready to be baptized until you're ready to take that risk. And he was a genuine convert, and he did. And uh, I don't know what happened, but I'm just sharing that with you. So I guess here's the question. Can you say, whether Lord, whether you take care of me or not, I'll obey, and I'll do what you ask because I'm trusting you. I'm seeking first you, your kingdom, your things, trusting that everything that I have need of is going to be taken care of. So whose slave are you? What is the true condition of your heart? 